Here we go. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for this webinar. I'll just give um, people a few minutes to join in. Feel free to get comfortable. We're just waiting for a few more people to log on. I'll just wait maybe another 30 seconds or so while people are getting comfortable logging in. Maybe we'll get started. So hi, everybody. Thank you all for joining us for this webinar, which is the first in a series of presentations that will be delivered on applying evidence in practice as part of the comorbidity project. And this is funded by the Australian Government Department of Health. My name is Christina Morell. I am a senior research fellow and program lead of treatment and translation in complex populations at the Matilda Centre for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use at the University of Sydney. I have the very great pleasure of facilitating this webinar and it will be presented by Associate Professor Lexine Stepinski. I would first like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the lands on which we are meeting and recognize that we're meeting across Australia today. The traditional owners of the lands that I'm currently on are the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, but I would also like to pay my respects to the other traditional owners across Australia for everyone who's here today. I'd also like to recognize and acknowledge the many people with lived experience of mental illness and substance use, as well as their families and carers, many of whom have generously contributed to the development of the comorbidity guidelines and other resources that are on our website. And I'll mention those a little later. So everybody here is probably quite a Zoom and online expert by now, but just to quickly go over a couple of things before we meet, I'm sorry, before we begin, First of all, just to let you all know that everyone here um, who's attending live today is in listen only mode. So this means that we cannot see or hear you. If um, you would like to ask a question or if you have any problems, I'd just like to draw your attention to the Q&A button on your screen and also the chat button there as well. Please feel free to click on that button and type in any questions or comments that you have at any time during the presentation. We will have around 10 minutes at the end of Lexine's talk for discussion and we'll go through those. If you experience any technical issues during the webinar today, you can contact Zoom support, or you can access the recording of the webinar, which we will be making available, as well as the PDF handouts of the slides today. And they'll be available to download from the website on your screen there at the end of the talk or later today. So as I mentioned, we have a very exciting series of webinars over the next 12 months. This first webinar will be focusing on anxiety and alcohol use, and you'll be able to access the recording and handouts either later today or tomorrow, at our website, the link will be on screen at the end of the talk today, and we'll also post it in the chat at some, at some stage. You can also find more about our upcoming webinars, which I posted on screen as well. And now, without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Lexine Stepinski, and she is an Associate Professor and Clinical Psychologist at the Matilda Centre for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use at the University of Sydney. Lexine's research focuses on understanding the interrelationship between anxiety and substance use disorders and how we can best optimize prevention, early intervention and treatment approaches for these commonly occurring conditions. So I will now hand over to Lexine. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for the introduction. And it's great to be with you um, here today talking about anxiety and alcohol use. Um, I'd like to start just by firstly acknowledging also the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia. Um, I'm joining you today from Darawal country, um, but I'd like to acknowledge the um, traditional owners throughout the land. Um, and recognise their con continuing connection to land, water and culture. Um, and in terms of what I'm going to cover today, I'll start out by talking about the evidence for the link between anxiety and alcohol use and also why it's important clinically. I'll then talk about what we know about treatments um, that are effective for people that have both anxiety and alcohol use problems. And then finally, um, 
I want to just take a brief look at the ways in which we might be able to intervene earlier in the life course in order to prevent um, the development and escalation of these problems in the first place. So I'm aware that um, a lot of the audience that might be joining us today work primarily with um, alcohol and substance use um, patients. So just some brief background to anxiety disorders. We know of course that anxiety is a very normal human emotion, um, very common um, and, a, and a helpful reaction in most circumstances. But we also know that for some people, this response tends to go into overdrive. And so at the other end of the continuum for people, anxiety can become hugely disabling and really having a, a big impact on their ability to um, function socially or at work um, and in other aspects of their life. And we know from our most recent national survey that around one in six Australians are affected by an anxiety disorder in the last 12 months. Um, and when we're talking about anxiety, we're generally talking about three core components. There's the physical component. Um, so this might be things like feeling um, heart pounding, dizziness or shaking. We know there's also a behavioural or sorry, a thoughts um, component, so the way um, that a person might worry, or also the way that they perceive events. Often in anxiety, we're talking about an exaggerated um, perception of threat, a tendency to, to see danger um, everywhere. Um, and then finally, we're talking about behaviours. So in the case of anxiety, the behaviours that are particularly relevant are avoidance. Um, which makes sense if that's something stressful um, and anxiety provoking for us, we want to avoid it. Um, so that can be both um, completely avoiding it or what we call safety behaviours. So these are things that you might do um, to cope with or reduce anxiety. Um, and alcohol is one example of, of something that people might do um, in an effort to reduce their anxiety. And we'll, of course, be talking more about that today. So in terms of the anxiety um, disorders that, that I'm focusing on in my work, so we've got uh, social anxiety, so the core threat, the core concerns in social anxiety are social concerns, so concerns about other people thinking um, I'm incompetent, boring, unlikable, for example panic disorder, where there's a combination of both physical and mental threat. So this might be concerns about physical symptoms, potentially meaning that I might be having a heart attack or a stroke, or that I might be losing control or going crazy. Um, and then generalised anxiety disorder, where we see there is just lots and lots of different worries, multiple different layers of threat, which might be around um, concerns about controlling worry it might be about um, letting other people down or performing well um, or just generally things going going wrong. So when I'm talking about anxiety these are these are the core um, kind of disorders that I'm focusing on in my work. So this brings us to um, our next question which is whether there's a link between anxiety and alcohol use. And we know that there's a lifetime prevalence um, in Australia of alcohol use disorder of about 22%. Um, now, Smith and Randall have looked, um, conducted some research to look internationally at the relationship with anxiety um, and alcohol use. And what they've found is that across um, several different studies and across disorders, so across um, GAD, agoraphobia, OCD, panic and social phobia, um, there's about a two to three times increased risk of having an alcohol use disorder if you have an anxiety disorder. So clearly an, an increased risk compared to the rest of the population um, who don't have anxiety. And then in some Australian um, data um, looked at by Marie Thiessen and colleagues back in 2009, what we saw there is that one in three people um, in Australia who has a substance use disorder also has an anxiety disorder. So 
<laughs> this tells us that it's pretty common. If we've got someone with substance use issues sitting in front of us, the chances that they might also have an anxiety disorder are reasonably high. So how do we understand the relationship between anxiety and alcohol use? Well, there's different models that have been proposed to understand this relationship. One model um, is that the anxiety disorder, the anxiety use disorder, sorry, the alcohol, I'll start again, is that the anxiety disorder precedes and gives rise to the alcohol use disorder. So you might have heard of um, self-medication, for example, or stress dampening models, which are, which are these kind of models. And the idea is that alcohol either has a real or a perceived um, anxiolytic, anxiety reducing effect. And so people with anxiety disorders come to use alcohol in an attempt to prevent or cope with their anxiety. In support of this idea, we do see that anxiety disorders typically have their onset prior to alcohol use disorders, so earlier um, in the life course. And in addition, there's some research that shows that the tendency to drink, to cope, um, coping motivated drinking, is related to the subsequent development of alcohol use problems. But a second explanation um, is that the alcohol use disorder may in fact induce anxiety. So when a person is withdrawing from alcohol, suddenly we know there is an increase in anxiety symptoms. Um, and it's thought that prolonged use of alcohol might disrupt the stress response system. So consistent with this model, some anxiety problems do seem to improve or remit after a period of alcohol abstinence. Um, so for example, there's evidence of this in the case of GAD, although less so for, for other um, disorders. So less so for something like social anxiety, for example. And due to what we know about the order of onset, um, it's estimated that at most this idea that the alcohol use disorder might cause the anxiety use disorder probably explains at most 25% of cases. So it's really not accounting for um, the full picture, doesn't look like. And finally, um, the third um, explanation is that there may well be genetic, demographic or personality factors that represent a common vulnerability for both disorders. And so this might explain why they co-occur at a higher rate. And so that's certainly, certainly a possibility. But in any case, no matter why the um, problems begin in the first place, it's likely that once they have developed, they tend to fuel each other in a, in a feed forward cycle. So, <coughs> excuse me. So the, um, the vicious cycle model, um, which has been talked about by um, Stuart and Conrad, among others, is one way that we can understand this relationship between anxiety and alcohol use problems. From this side fr framework, um, the tendency to self-medicate with alcohol can lead over time to an increasing reliance on the use of alcohol to cope with anxiety, stress or other emotions. And then this in turn leads to more drinking um, and as drinking increases, as alcohol use increases, so does tolerance and so does the risk of developing alcohol dependence symptoms and potentially a range of alcohol related problems. So in this way, alcohol use can exacerbate symptoms of anxiety, both through the withdrawal effects that someone might experience, but also because it um, can increase problems, can increase social problems, work problems, legal problems, health problems, and, and kind of general um, life chaos, which in turn can increase anxiety. So what we're really seeing here is that there can be this vicious cycle between the two problems, where each problem is, is making the other one worse. So 
this brings us to one of the reasons why it is important to think about this clinically because of that relationship, interrelationship between the two problems. When someone has both um, an anxiety and an alcohol use disorder, the problems tend to be more debilitating. They also tend to be more chronic and the vicious cycle also impacts on recovery. So what we see is that people with both disorders don't respond as well to the standard treatment approaches. Um, and this is potentially for a few reasons. One is that having both disorders can impact with the capacity to engage with um, standard treatments. So just to give one example, you can imagine that for a person with social anxiety, uh, it's quite um, challenging, quite intimidating to go, for example, to a group treatment program um, or even to seek treatment at all can be quite anxiety provoking for someone with social anxiety. Um, and then we also see that um, because anxiety symptoms might be triggers for drinking, they are strong predictors of relapse following um, alcohol treatment and also they're predictors of, of just not, um, not being able to um, get as much out of treatment as other people might. So um, either dropping out of treatment or just less of a, um, less of a treatment response. So given what we see about the high rates of co-occurrence between these um, disorders, I guess one of the take home messages is that is, it's important when you have a patient with um, a substance use um, disorder in front of you, it is important to ask routinely about anxiety. Um, and I've just put on this slide some assessment tools that I um, that are quite quick, quite quick, but um, useful as a kind of routine screening for different anxieties, so for uh, GAD, social anxiety, and um, panic disorder. Um, in addition, when we're asking clients about alcohol use, it's really useful to explore that relationship that there might be with anxiety. So we know that when we're talking with clients about alcohol use, a non-confrontational motivational approach is most effective. Um, you'd already be you know, looking to explore um, ambivalence and reasons to change. But in addition, um, with people that have co-occurring problems, we also want to be exploring the function of alcohol use in relation to anxiety. And this might include uncovering some of the unrealistic beliefs that the person might have. Um, so for example, it might be believing that alcohol is helpful in some way. So potentially helping the person to feel more confident, helping them to feel sexier, helping them to um, be more talkative. Um, so being aware of these uh, cognitions is important because later on in treatment, um, it will be important to examine them um, more critically. And I would also just mention the alcohol expectancies questionnaire, which can be a useful um, just list of the common beliefs that people might have that are relevant to the interrelationship. <coughs> Okay, so what does this mean in practice? Well, um, what I just wanted to um, to share is two uh, case examples that illustrate the, um, the relationship between anxiety and alcohol use problems and might give you a bit of a flavour of um, what you might be looking for when you have uh, people with these presentations. And so these case examples are based on the work that we've done um, treating co-occurring disorders, but in order to protect patient um, confidentiality and privacy, they don't represent one single person. So it's rather it's um, reflective of a range of experiences that we see in practice. So first of all, I'll just describe Claire. Um, so Claire is in her early 40s. Um, married with one daughter. Her anxiety tends to be more of that sort of GAD flavour. Um, so she's quite perfectionistic, has very high um, standards for herself and for others. And her anxiety is focused around performance um, and 
concerns about being perceived as incompetent. Now, in terms of the motivations for her alcohol use, she's commonly drinking alcohol to unwind um, and to forget to just really switch off from her stress and worries. Over time, that has meant that her um, alcohol use has increased, has sort of crept up, she's noticed, and it's crept up to about one to two bottles of wine daily. Um, and she, we really see with Claire that there is this uh, vicious cycle going on. So these rebound anxiety effects. Because of her drinking, she is um, she experiences a lot of stress and kind of feeling um, disorganized and like things aren't going well, you know, the next day in the morning when she gets up. Um, but in addition, she feels embarrassment about her drinking, embarrassment about other people and how they might perceive her drinking, and particularly worries about the impact of her drinking on her daughter. So in terms of her motivations to change, really those negative impacts that the alcohol is having on her um, on both her life, but also her anxiety were a key driver. And the second case that I'll just um, introduce is Luke. So he was um, in his late twenties living alone and his anxiety were really focused around social interactions, being nervous, particularly when talking with women. A lot of his friends had settled down with partners but he felt quite left behind because he hadn't been able to do that. Um, he used to drink in advance to manage his anxiety at social events. He felt like he was only really able to talk with um, women when he had had something to drink. So on weekends, he would drink 16 plus drinks, but his drinking had tended to expand um, beyond just drinking when he was going out. And he was also drinking to um, at home when he was on his own in the evening during the week. And this he described as being in response to the low mood that he was feeling um, and the hopelessness that he felt about his ability to form relationships. Um, in terms of his motivations to change, we saw again here that rebound effect of the alcohol use on anxiety, where Luke would report feeling um, embarrassed after a night out of drinking. He would experience memory loss, he wasn't sure what he'd said and he would then become very concerned that he might have said something um, embarrassing or that he might have made a bad impression on someone. So it really fueled his social anxiety. Um, although he perceived that it helped him kind of get started, take the edge off at the start of a night out, his drinking really fueled his anxiety um, and made it worse. Uh, the next day and in subsequent um, social events. So I'm going to come back to these um, cases in a um, in a little while as I talk more about the treatment. So moving on then to our question about what are the most effective treatment approaches. <coughs> so um, for people with co-occurring anxiety and substance use problems, services tend to be set up such that some services specialise in the treatment of substance use, while other services are specialised in the treatment of anxiety. So it does mean for people having to choose um, or accessing treatment from two different places. Um, and this can mean that people who experience both anxiety and alcohol use get stuck on a what can be called a, a comorbidity roundabout, where they're referred from one service um, onto another because of their dual problem um, presentation. And as I mentioned before, in, the, in some cases, anxiety does remit when people stop drinking for a little while. And so it has been the case that patients, um, it's often the case that patients are advised to work on stopping their drinking first. And, you know, there are some really good reasons to do this. We know that alcohol use can have um, a cognitive impact on people. So reducing or stopping drinking is going to mean a clearer head to engage with treatment. But the trouble is that cutting back can be really difficult for people with co-occurring disorders. Um, 
because of, because of the way that anxiety is a, is a trigger um, for their drinking. So they really may need some additional support to help them manage that anxiety. So a really important question for us then is whether it would be better to treat anxiety and alcohol use problems together. Um, and the reasons to do this would be, well, as I said, because people's problems um, may be interrelated, they may see their problems as being related, and also that evidence that we have that standard treatment approaches don't work as well for people with co-occurring disorders. So I'm going to tell you now about some work that we did funded by the NHMRC, um, which was to evaluate this idea of um, treating anxiety and alcohol use together. And this was specifically in the context of social anxiety disorder, which is a disorder that we commonly see um, co-occurring with alcohol use. So in the case of social anxiety and alcohol use, there have been two previous trials that have looked at this question of whether it's better to treat the two problems together. But both of these trials have involved unintegrated treatments. So two treatments delivered either one after the other or in parallel. And the results have not been particularly promising. In fact, in one case, the Randall study, there were actually worse alcohol outcomes. So in this study, uh, participants received treatment for social anxiety from one psychologist at one location, and then treatment for alcohol use disorder from another therapist at another location. And this resulted in worse alcohol outcomes than just uh, focusing purely on CBT for the alcohol use disorder. And by way of explanation, the authors of this study said that providing two different treatments from two different psychologists may have confused or overwhelmed or provided mixed messages to clients. And so what may be really important is to provide an integrated treatment package that explicitly um, addresses the, the two problems together, but also the interconnections between them. And so that was really what we wanted to do in our study, was to look at integrating the treatment um, approach into a cohesive, coherent package. Um, and it was the first project of its kind to integrate treatment for social anxiety and alcohol use. Um, so what we did was we took the current evidence-based um, treatments for social anxiety, so this was a CBT-based approach, um, and then we integrated this with evidence-based approaches for alcohol use. So this included CBT, but also motivational interviewing, given the um, evidence base behind that approach. Um, and so the treatment um, framework incorporated both motivational interviewing and CBT, and the skills in the, in the program were applied both to social anxiety, to alcohol use, but they were also, um, also applied to address, to explicitly address that interrelationship between social anxiety and alcohol use. So I'll talk you through um, each of the strategies now. So first of all, the entire treatment program was embedded within a motivational framework. Um, and we started the initial sessions focusing particularly on developing a shared understanding of the problem um, and also trying to get some early gains in terms of the person's alcohol use. So setting some um, goals together about what they wanted to achieve. Now our um, preferred goal initially was um, abstinence to help the person uh, build some momentum and begin to um, reduce their dependence on alcohol. But because the treatment program uh, does have that motivational framework, it was really up to the client to determine their goals. But as I said, initially, we were really trying to make some initial um, gains in alcohol use to relieve some of the chaos that might be going on for the person um, and also get them into a, a position where they could uh, cognitively benefit from the remainder of the treatment program. 
So in combination with the early sessions, we're also, also looking at helping them to build coping skills to manage their triggers for drinking, which may include um, managing anxiety triggers. And we also were looking to enhance social supports um, because we know that people can tend to have mostly drinking, drinking buddies. So we wanted to enhance existing social supports that may be positive and, and help the person in achieving their goals. Also looked at um, activities, interests and friendships that did not revolve around drinking and trying to support and build up, re-engage with these interests rather than um, activities that tend to revolve around drinking. And then early on, so in about session three or four, we began um, really focusing on looking at some of the cognitive processes that are contributing to anxiety and drinking for the person. So in the case of social anxiety, people tend to um, expect the worst in social situations. They tend to think it's really likely that they'll be negatively evaluated and that those consequence, consequences will be very severe. So the cognitive work involves looking at those, um, looking critically at those thinking processes and also some of the cognitions that can underline, underlie drinking, so drinking thinking, um, as well as cognitions and beliefs that might drive the interrelationship between anxiety and alcohol use, such as positive beliefs about the function of alcohol, such as um, it makes me more interesting or it makes me perform better socially. And people with social anxiety have over time come to avoid many different types of social situations. And so the next part of treatment was to encourage people to gradually reduce their avoidance and practice new coping skills to manage their anxiety rather than using alcohol in these situations. And so this approach is in contrast to some um, alcohol treatment approaches which might encourage avoidance of any cues that trigger um, drinking. So this might be people or places that trigger drinking. But instead with this integrated treatment what we're doing is we're encouraging people to use a, a graded sort of step ladder um, behavioural experiment approach to gradually build up their capacity to handle these situations without um, using alcohol. And then finally, we know from research that people with social anxiety are um, hypervigilant to any cues that might indicate negative feedback from other people. And so uh, one of the components of the program was attention training to help them reduce this hypervigilance, but also to help people uh, disengage their attention and refocus from sticky, repetitive thoughts. And right at the, or towards the end of the program, we worked with clients to make a plan for how they were gonna continue change and manage any um, setbacks that they might experience. So we conducted a randomized controlled trial to find out whether this integrated treatment package that had been developed could improve outcomes for people who were diagnosed with both social anxiety and alcohol use disorder. And there were 117 people in the trial, um, about half female, and these people were randomly allocated to receive the integrated treatment package or they received um, a CBT package which was focused on alcohol use only. And both of the treatments were similar in that they were 10 sessions, they were individually delivered, and um, they were delivered by the same pool of psychologists who had not received uh, specialised training in management of comorbidity. And so I've told you already quite a bit about the integrated treatment package and then the comparison package was similar in that it incorporated both CBT and motivational enhancement but this time the skills were applied only to help reduce alcohol use. And the measures that we were interested in looking at was whether um, 
whether integrated treatment would result in improvements in people's social anxiety symptoms, the number of drinks that they consumed, their dependence symptoms, but also their overall functioning and quality of life. Participants were also given the option of pharmacotherapy to help reduce their alcohol dependence if that was warranted. So they were giving a medical review, which also assessed uh, whether there was risk of complicated alcohol withdrawal that needed to be managed. And as you can see, our completion rates were 64% in the alcohol treatment and 70% in the integrated treatment. And we followed up participants at post-treatment and also at three month and six month follow-up. So in terms of the results, the analyses were all intention to treat uh, multi-level mixed models for repeated measures and we modelled missing data using FIML. And as you can see here for social anxiety symptoms, there was a clear effect where the participants in the integrated group had significantly greater reductions in social anxiety at all three time points. So you can see the blue line is the integrated um, treatment there. And then looking now though at the alcohol consumption and severity of dependence, what we saw here was a pattern where both groups were making um, reductions, significant reductions in their drinking and in their dependence. And this is very interesting because as I mentioned before, in the integrated treatment, the participants were being encouraged to reduce their social avoidance. So they were attending more social events and activities. And these are people who in the past used to medicate their social anxiety using alcohol. But what we see here is that they are managing to engage with social events and activities while at the same time managing to reduce their drinking. And in terms of overall functioning, we're seeing that the integrated treatment also had additional benefits. So the integrated um, treatment improved quality of life by six months relative to the control group and also uh, reduced depression symptoms compared to the alcohol only treatment. So just to summarize what we found in with the same number of treatment sessions, the integrated treatment led to better social anxiety outcomes, equivalent reductions in alcohol consumption, and it also led to better overall quality of life and lower depression by the six month follow up point. And I guess in terms of the question of whether we should treat these problems together, another consideration is that people with anxiety do tend to see people with anxiety and alcohol use, alcohol use problems do tend to see these problems as interrelated. And so it seemed like the integrated treatment was a better fit um, with clients' experience of their problems. So coming back now um, to Claire and Luke and how treatment panned out for them. For Claire, a really big thing was getting her out of her strong evening routine of pouring a glass of wine as soon as she walked in the door. Um, and so developing an alternative routine and alternative activities her, for her in the evening was really important. In addition, the cognitive therapy component was important both for challenging the cognitions underlying her anxiety, but also her positive um, expectancies about alcohol helping her to relax and that kind of belief that she had that she deserved a drink at the end of a, a tough day. Um, but what we really saw with Claire was that reducing her alcohol led to pretty immediate effects on her anxiety. She was more motivated in the evening to get organised um, and so she was much less irritable and stressed the next day. And so she directly observed the impact of reducing her drinking on her anxiety. She became less stressed, but also less worried about her daughter and the impact on her daughter. So she was able to use that evidence to then um, challenge that belief that drinking was helping her to relax. Um, then in the case of Luke, we worked on strategies to help him reduce his drinking both at home um, where he found that if he didn't 
by our colleague and have it in that in the house that was a really effective strategy for him um, in addition we worked on building up his confidence in social situations with a combination of exposure behavioral experiments and cognitive therapy it was really important to challenge his beliefs that alcohol helped him talk to women by looking at that evidence critically as you know there was certainly um, evidence that his memory loss and the effects of alcohol weren't actually helping him socialize with women and he he um, did a tested out behaviorally his belief that he wasn't able to talk to women without drinking so he um, started to attempt more conversations with women sober starting from easier situations and then building up um, so that his confidence increased over time so I'd like to just mention this paper in Cognitive and Behavioural Practice, which has a description of the treatment in detail and also its clinical application and some case vignettes. Um, and we also have therapist and client workbooks, which I'm really happy to share with people if that's helpful. Um, so just email me and I can send you a copy. Now I've talked mostly hear about social anxiety but just to say that there is some emerging evidence around integrated treatment for other co-occurring disorders which have summarized here so one study looking um, and showing some benefits of integrated treatment for co-occurring OCD and substance use also one study looking at co-occurring panic and alcohol use and showing some benefits for integrated treatment and then the area where there's probably the most um, evidence is in co-occurring PTSD and substance use where there's been a number of studies supporting the benefits of integrated um, treatment. So finally I'd just like to talk briefly about some ways that we can intervene earlier on to prevent these problems um, and the reason this is really important is because we know there are really long delays to seek treatment so on average it takes 18 years and I'm sure that you see um, clinically that, that what this means is by the time people are actually getting you getting to you in treatment they've experienced already considerable impairment and disruption to their work their relationships and their quality of life so what we wanted to look at was whether we could intervene earlier in the life course and prevent some of this um, impairment uh, intervene before the conditions um, before anxiety and alcohol use problems become entrenched and the other reason to intervene earlier is we know that there's developmental links between anxiety and alcohol use um, that start around that adolescent early adulthood period so young people with anxiety disorders are more likely to start drinking earlier. They're also more likely to use alcohol to cope with their symptoms. And they're more likely to progress from using to developing a um, alcohol use disorder. In addition to young adulthood being a high risk period in terms of um, the onset of drinking related problems, also the onset of anxiety. We know that it's also quite an important developmental period with a lot of changes happening for the person, such as starting new relationships, sorry, starting new um, uh, jobs or studies or new living arrangements and also forming new um, relationships and friendships. And so navigating these experiences is potentially <coughs> um, quite challenging for people who are prone to experiencing anxiety and so coping styles such as the tendency to drink to cope might become more pronounced across this transition. So given these particular needs and risks during um, the developmental stage of young adulthood, we wanted to develop an anxiety alcohol intervention that was specifically tailored for use. So we took as a starting point the um, anxiety and alcohol treatment program that I talked about earlier, but we knew it needed to be adapted for the specific needs of youth. And when we started consulting with youth and also with the literature um, about the type of treatment that would be most beneficial, what we were hearing was that young people prefer internet 
delivered therapy uh, because of some of the advantages that it, they perceived it to have such as more convenience and flexibility um, more privacy um, and reduced perceived stigma around accessing treatment so what we developed was an internet delivered treatment that took the treatment program um, that I talked about earlier, but condensed it into a five module package. Um, and rather than focusing specifically on social anxiety, we brought in additional strategies so that people could apply the anxiety management techniques to also general anxiety and panic as well. And we developed it in consultation with young people. So we included features that young people um, told us they would find interactive and engaging. And the program involved the online um, materials, but also psychologist support. So this was provided during two phone sessions, but also via weekly um, emails to provide troubleshooting and help to enhance motivation. So you can see here some of the um, interactive or engaging features that we included, um, such as videos, short videos um, about each of the core skills um, and also opportunities to complete quizzes and, and interactive um, tasks. And we trialled this program um, between 2017 and 2019 among 123 participants who were aged 17 to 24. They could be living anywhere in Australia, which is another one of the advantages of the internet delivery that we can roll it out to um, participants or let participants access it who are living in regional um, areas where they may not have access to such good mental health services. Um, and participants were all reporting anxiety symptoms as well as harmful alcohol use. And they were randomised to receive either the inroads program with that weekly psychologist support, or they received a uh, control condition which involved some information about harms relating to alcohol and guidelines for safe um, recommended drinking. And we assessed participants at two months and six months after they um, completed treatment and our follow-up rates were at that around the 70% uh, mark. So in terms of our results from the trial, what we saw was that the inroads program resulted in significant improvements in anxiety and these were observed um, immediately in the case of immediately following treatment, sorry. And in the case of social anxiety, the differences between the inroads group, which is there in the blue, and the control group were sustained um, out at six month follow up. And then in terms of the results for alcohol use, what we saw is that both groups were able to reduce their drinking initially, but in the control group, we saw a rebound in terms of their consumption. Whereas the participants in the inroads group were able to sustain the, um, the reductions that they'd made out to six months follow up. So the, the basic summary in terms of the picture of results was that the inroads program improved anxiety more immediately. Um, but the benefits in terms of drinking emerged later on. So there was a relapse to drinking by six months in the control group, and this was not seen in the inroads group. So they had the capacity to sustain their reductions. And this makes sense given that they were being provided with skills to help them manage their anxiety, which in turn can help them um, sustain those changes to their drinking. And what we saw, just to put it into context, was that by a six month follow up, those young people that are in the inroads group had reduced their drinking, their monthly drinking, by 62 standard drinks um, and were having four fewer binge drinking episodes per month. So we finished this trial in 2019 um, and then, of course, COVID happened. And so what we're seeing with the COVID pandemic is an increase in anxiety and stress among young people. And we're also seeing um, some data showing that Australians are reporting higher alcohol consumption and that this may be linked 
to the additional stress and anxiety they're experiencing. So what we've, um, in terms of our next steps, we wondered whether the Inroads program, because of its internet delivery, might be a really um, helpful way to support young people during the COVID pandemic. Because of the internet delivery, it can be rolled out even in times of restriction and lockdown. But in addition, the internet format means that um, it can be rolled out quite widely. And so we received some funding from the Australian Government Department of Health to adapt the inroads program to help young people in the current environment. And we made um, we adapted the program in two ways. The first was we included additional content and vignettes to help young people apply the skills and strategies specifically to the COVID-19 context. But then in addition, in order to increase the scalability of the program and our capacity to offer it, roll it out really widely, we incorporated auto messaging that was responsive to the content that young people entered into the program and that would provide uh, motivation, support, troubleshooting and accountability in place of psychologist um, involvement. And so the the Inroads program is currently open for business. We're, um, we're recruiting for an open um, trial. This would be a free trial of the program. We're looking for people that want to, um, who want to enroll in the program who are between ages of 17 and 19, uh, sorry, 17 and 30 and living in, in Australia, anywhere in Australia, who are experiencing anxiety symptoms, as well as drinking alcohol use above recommended guidelines. And the program can be offered as a standalone program, or because there's no um, psychologist involvement in this version of the program, it can also be an adjunct to psychologist sessions. So if you're seeing a young person, you might consider referring them to the Inroads program to gain some additional um, skills and strategies while they're working with you. So you can visit inroads.org.au for more information or young people can visit the website themselves to um, assess whether the program might be beneficial for them and register to gain access. So that's everything that I'm going to talk about today, but just a quick summary in a nutshell of, of, um, of the key messages. It's really important that we do ask about anxiety and the link with um, alcohol use. We need to also build a mutual understanding with the client of the interrelationship between anxiety and alcohol use, and this can help us to motivate them to make the changes uh, that, they, that they're wanting to make. And we also need to make sure that across the lifespan, we're enhancing coping strategies, both in terms of helping people to manage their anxiety, their alcohol, and importantly, helping them to manage the interconnection between these problems. So I'd like to finish by just thanking um, my co-authors on this work, also um, the funders of the, um, the various trials and projects that I've talked about today. And I'd encourage you to email me if you do have any questions or feedback and also visit our, um, our website. So for the Inroads program, or we have a Facebook and Twitter presence um, for the Inroads program as well. So thank you and I'm really happy to take any questions and looking forward um, to also a discussion with, um, with you as well. Thank you so much, Lexine. That was fantastic. So we have had a lot of questions come through and I would like to start off the first one, perhaps asking um, whether you could comment on uh, what if a person has GAD and social anxiety together? 
Yeah, okay, so um, thank you, thanks for the question. And I guess I would just say that um, in our trial, we didn't exclude people who had co-occurring other um, anxiety disorders. So we certainly did have people who had both social anxiety and generalised anxiety. Um, the, the generalised anxiety could have even been um, primary in some cases. So. I, I think it would be fine to um, to take this this same approach, and then of course you're just you've just got multiple targets for the person's anxiety. So when you're applying the strategies, um, you've got more work to do as a clinician, I guess, just in terms of identifying those cognitions, identifying the kind of behavioural tasks that would be useful for them to do, given they've got the the broader um, anxiety problems. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, there's a lot of questions that come through. Yeah, I'll try and answer to quickly. <laughs> it's not my forte, but I'll try. No, we'll, we'll do our best. Okay. Um, this is following up on the Claire case study that you were talking about. Mm. Um, would you say that there's a risk in developing new strategies to unwind in the evenings that Claire might swap one addictive disorder for another? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. It's definitely something to be looking out for when we're working on their alcohol use that they're not replacing. Um, and so I guess that's just part of a kind of open, frank discussion with the client um, that you're exploring together. But just to add that one of the things that is really useful um, we found in the program was using that to our advantage in terms of replacing with something else that then became the kind of addiction. So um, in the case of, of Claire, for example, example, one of the key strategies was she developed another drink that she liked to make for herself in the evening and had these kind of routines and habits. You know, as humans, we're such, we really are creatures of habit in some ways. So she then developed this really strong routine around this non-alcoholic drink that she would make really not every night to unwind. And she then had to have that instead. So I think mm -hmm. you can also use that kind of replacement, stimulus replacement um, to your advantage as well. But it's a great question and great thing to just watch out for as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a couple of people have asked whether there is any involvement of pharmacotherapy in terms of integrated treatment and in particular, um, any evidence about naltrexone yes. for the treatment of anxiety and alcohol use? Yeah, so the process, so we do know that pharmacotherapy can be really helpful for people, um, for a subset of people with managing their alcohol dependence. So what we did in our trial was everyone was receiving um, a medical review. So this was to make sure that their withdrawal, um, to assess for withdrawal management as well um, and get some support around that if they needed it, but also to see if they might benefit from pharmacotherapy. So uh, a proportion of the participants in our trial, less than 30%, were also on pharmacotherapy and that could have been naltrexone um, or it could have been um, baclofen. There are a couple that they, that they could have been on. Yes. And uh, just in terms of, I guess, the broader evidence around around those pharmacotherapies, I have to say that is I'm a psychologist, so that's not specifically my area, but I would look into um, Kirsten Morley's work. So she's really looked um, together with Paul Haber at a number of um, trials, really looking at pharmacotherapy and what's best in the case of anxiety and alcohol mm -hmm. use specifically. Mm -hmm. We'll actually be having Kirsten Molly present at an upcoming oh. webinar, so stay tuned. Oh, there you go. <laughs> she can tell you all about it. Um, so we have had some questions about different population groups, in particular um, older middle-aged people, um, diverse populations in terms of Indigenous populations, um, sexuality and gender diversity and gender. Um, can you talk to any of those different groups? Were they How are they involved or is the program suitable to those groups? Yeah, so I guess where we're at with this program is it was really, um, so the first program that I talked to about um, adult treatment was really the first one of its kind that's tested integrated treatment at all in any population. Um, and then likewise with the inroads program, it's the first one that's then tested with um, a younger population. So we're really like at the kind of early, early stages. Um, but I guess in terms of those different groups, in the inroads um, trial that I spoke about, we were really aware of um, the, the potential, because you're talking about dating and, you know, the way that diversity might be affecting uh, the, the skills and the discussions that you're having. Um, so in that particular trial, we have assessed for a lot of that different diversity and we're um, working on a follow-up paper at the moment where we're going to look at different moderators. So did people benefit 
just as much um, or do we need to adapt the program further for particular special populations like mm -hmm. that? You mm -hmm. mentioned older populations, did you, mm -hmm. just then? Mm -hmm. Yes, at all. Uh, yeah, okay. So um, Louise Mutton also might be mm -hmm. worth having a look if people are interested because she's doing some follow-up work, um, not so much about in comorbidity, but just specifically looking at how do you help older adults with their, um, alcohol reduction in terms of other particular issues to consider in that space. Yep, great idea, great idea. Um, I can probably fit in one more question, I think. <laughs> um, do, did you want to talk any, um, uh, oh, which question? I don't know, there's so many. <laughs> Uh, Do you want to choose a question? Yes. Um, there are a few questions about um, the Inroads program. So as I mentioned at the end, we're, uh, we're opening that program free access at the moment, the self-guided version of the program. So it can um, be something that you get a young person to do on their own or together with a clinician. Um, and I think we're going to post up the link so people can access it, but it is free um, for people as part of our open trial. Everyone will get the program, but we're just going to trial how they do. And someone asked about whether people experiencing depression um, and anxiety could go into the trial. And yes, um, that that wouldn't be an exclusion. Only we do assess just, um, we just make sure, so in terms of suicidality, we just make sure that people aren't at, at a risk level that really they need much more intensive support than just an internet delivered program. So that's the only reason why someone might be um, excluded on the basis of their depression. But otherwise, please do um, encourage young people to enroll in the program. Thank you. And very sorry if we didn't get to your question, please email any questions that you have that we missed to Lexine. And just quickly before we end, um, this webinar, as I mentioned, is part of our comorbidity project. You can find out more information about that and the comorbidity guidelines at our website, which is on the screen there. Actually, it's not on screen, hopefully. No, there it is on screen there. It's got more resources, hard copies of our guidelines. We're going to have a few of these left, online training and our face-to-face -face and train the trainer programs. Our next webinar will be on the 18th of June, and that will be on psychosis and substance use presented by Associate Professor Julia Lavin. Then we will have Dr. Susie Hudson talking about implementing evidence-based practice. And in August, Dr. Robert Fullerton on applying motivational enhancement approaches to co-occurring disorders. But until then, thank you so much. And thank you, Lexine. It was a really great webinar. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Please enjoy the rest of your days. Or day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.